Hello and welcome to the hearing. I'm John. And from Chicago's north side, I'm Scotto. And without any further ado, on to this week's album, which is from 1990, Fear of a Black Planet by Public Enemy. Public Enemy is an American hip-hop group formed in formed by Chuck D and Flava Flav on Long Island, New York in 1985. The group gained attention for their dense, ferocious sound, a stark contrast from West Coast hip-hop, and their lyrics, which featured direct political commentary, strong criticism of the U.S. media, and frank discussion of the frustrations and concerns of the African-American community. Fear of a Black Planet is the group's third studio album, it was released on April 10th, 1990 by Def Jam Recordings and Columbia Records, produced by Chuck D, Eric Vietnam Sadler, Hank Shockley, and Keith Shockley, King Keith Shockley sorry, and features Chuck D on rapping, Fave of Flav on rapping, Terminator X on scratching, Bomb Squad on production, and way too many other people to list here for the full <laughs> list. Check Wikipedia. I was wondering how far you were going to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just the, the top line and then check Wikipedia. Reminder, I don't edit any songs into our reviews for copyright reasons, but down in the description, if you're listening to this on YouTube or on our blog at John and Scotto, you'll find links to Fear of a Black Planet on Spotify and YouTube, so you can follow along if you'd like. On to track one, Contract on the World Love Jam. This is what on Spotify is called an instrumental, um, because there's no rapping, it's all samples. Right. Um, great groove. There's some nice scratching, some nice sound bites. A lot of the sound bites are from the news, and they talk about controversies in rap and an Afrocentric point of view. It's basically just the prelude. It's, you know, introducing you to Public Enemy. Yeah, in my notes I put, I hope you're cool with some mood setting pieces. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> that's all. Well, where were that came from yeah. with this? Um, um, Lots of James Brown samples, of course. Yeah. Uh, on to track two, Brother's Gonna Work It Out. Great groove. Nice sample of some of this blistering guitar solo. I want to say Hendrix, but I actually think it's Prince, you know, trying to be Hendrix. It reminds it's, me. It's uh, Prince from Let's Go Crazy. That's exactly what I was just going to say. I thought it was the, the Let's Go Pr Crazy solo at the end. Yeah. Um, love how dense their production is. Oh, yeah. it's Everything is just a punch yeah. to the jaw. Mm -hmm. there's very little on this album where it's like subtle or under you yeah, know yeah. For, underwhelming it's it's all over the top I, I have this note later but it's i think the first actual song is the best place to put it public enemy was the hip-hop group that like it was okay for the rock people the rock guys to like yeah because they were basically the hip-hop equivalent of punk that's or even or metal whichever or metal. you want to put it i mean because yeah. they are just it is just balls to the wall like there's no there's no ballad you know it was just loud and angry <laughs> and dense and it was you know if you were that you know hyper masculine rock guy it was cool to like public enemy yeah um but back to brother's gonna work it out nice call and response brother's gonna work it out i don't want to sound like i'm trying to you know imply something there. Um, yeah, this is going to be a lot of uh, Michael Bolton from Office Space, you know, yeah. rolling up the windows in this review, isn't there? Unfortunately. Um, <laughs> nice call and response between Chuck and Flav. Um, love how Chuck plays with rhythm. He doesn't rap just straightforward on the beat. He, he brings lines in when you don't expect them. Yeah. Um, lo always love that. Um, there's some nice... Um, background vocals on each side in the chorus like a line i go you know goes to one side then goes to the other i love it whenever that's done and it just nicely rides out on the groove and what's that wawa effect they use it's like a i mean it's a very industrial sounding you know mm -hmm. grinding thing that they would put in there so i don't know if they were influenced by some of the early industrial guys but it feels like they're kind of I, I don't, touching on it a little here and there. 85. I don't know if they were kind of contemporary with industrial. Yeah, but this is like 89 at this, this point. This was 90. Um, or 90, yeah. So it's and, like the year after Land of Rape and Honey. And... But I, I remember a couple of songs from the first album, and or from, you know, um, Nation of Millions Can't Hold Us Back, I think at first or second. 
and it was a very similar sound. Public Enemy always kind of sounded like this, you know. Um, yeah. So I think I I think Public Enemy and a lot of the industrial bands were kind of going for the same thing. Yeah, it's it's just uh, something you don't expect when you're listening to hip hop. Yeah, I just don't. I don't know if it was an influence <laughs> issue as they just wanted it to be, you know, intense and irritating and grinding. And That's just... what I'm thinking, right. I'm thinking they heard some of these industrial acts and wanted to work it in. I don't, and I don't it is think... like completely revolutionary to do too. At, at I, I don't think, time. I don't think they took it from industrial. I think the bomb squad was just like, okay, you want this kind of sound? We'll throw this in it and do it. I don't think it came necessarily from industrial. Um, I think they both. I think it was a case of independent innovation. They both came up with it at the same time. Could be for yeah. the same reason. They both wanted that same effect. On to track three, one of the singles. Nine one one is a joke. A rare flavor Flav rap. Um, love the bass sample. I initially said Flav should have more leads. I ended up regretting that. <laughs> yeah. But this one's uh this, this is a great one's one. great. Yeah. Um well great big infectious chorus. Um there's a always big, love a Vincent Price appearance. There's a yeah, big infectious laugh after the first chorus. Um and I love the sample at the end. Uh there's not a minute to spare. Right. And don't worry. Because <laughs> the whole <laughs> song, if you don't know it, is about how late nine one one you call nine one one, they don't show up for a long time in the in the inner city, of course. I mean I remember this back in the day shall i say um mm. and, and just how much this opened a door for the white kids yeah because before this you know a service is a service and of course if you dialed it they would show up in a reasonable time but the fact that there's this other world where shit just doesn't work mm -hmm. and you can't chalk it up to being in some other country but it's happening like right in our own country only because of race, money, and geography. Mm -hmm. This was, opened the door for a lot of white kids, but they had been trying to open that door for a decade by this point. Hell, go <laughs> back to the message. <laughs> wow, I think the I think that was a much more internal thing. This is you know, when you're using Flavor Flav. Yeah, you're going to appeal to more white kids. <laughs> you know, Ice T was a bit before this. The whole gangster rap thing was, you know. At least, you know, the heart of it was a bit before this, you know. They've been trying to get that message out for a decade. It, I think it, it just started to land at this point. Well, I think that's what they were going for here, though. Like, I think those are, they're expressing it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's more internal. Where I think they were very clever here and realized that this can sell to a white audience, too. Right. I mean, yeah. The imagery they were using, of course, with like as they they talk about you know the fake Uzis and stuff, but mm -hmm. it's just a, more of a punk rock thing, which of course appeals to everybody. Right. <laughs> I mean, uh, Nation of Millions had a couple of singles on yeah. MTV. Um, I think they worked with Anthrax before this, or was it? Wasn't it? I think it was after this. Was it after this? Okay, maybe short, very shortly after. Um, but they had gotten. They... They parody the I Got Black Caesar in the Crib line in that right. Anthrax song with, yo, I got okay. white Caesar in the crib. Right. <laughs> it's um, always cracked me up because <laughs> I knew exactly where it was from. You know, so they knew they had that crossover appeal at this point. Yeah. So, yeah, they, they def, I think this is where they, they really kind of, you know, amped it up and said, like, okay, this is going to be the, a sing, the single. This is going to be the big single. This is where we really try to get the message out. And as directly as possible. And I think that might be why they gave it to Flav, because it's, yeah. he's going to be more noticeable, because he doesn't rap leads very often. Exactly. And it's very, it, it was very clever. And he doesn't come off angry like Chuck no. does. <laughs> you know? No, he, he adds, you know, an element of humor to it. If it's just right. like, this shit just ain't working. Yeah. So, yeah, this is put open the door. That's a good point. Even though they'd been trying to push that door open for a, right. a, at least a decade. At least in hip-hop. Hip-hop, you know, had been known to white people for about a decade. You know, not white people, but, like, the mainstream white audience had known about hip-hop for about a decade at that point. 
So ah, I don't know. Like when I uh, to the white audience, I'm not sure when it actually when it really hit. You know, I, I mean, I was into break dancing in the early '80s. So ah, well, yeah, I guess right. That's uh, yeah, when break dancing kind of went over. Went I just wasn't mainstream. thinking of of these guys in the same element as break dancing stuff. Well, because the the hip hop that was being sold to those audience was at the time in the early '80s was a lot lighter. Yeah was a lot, you know, milder. Um, it was, you know, maybe a little spicier than Sugar Hell Gang. <laughs> <laughs> Except when you get to the message, which Except, is, of course, exactly. on the its message, own. <laughs> which gets dark. And I love, it's probably my favorite hip-hop tune. But, you know, it, it is fantastic. It is yeah. amazing. But, you know, they they kind of had the door. They had the, 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 the potential for the audience since the 80s. It had just belt and belt to the point where you know the 90s were when rap kind of became the new rock and roll well and i think there's a thing with the white audience that that i can feel much more comfortably speaking about being a member of that white audience Mm -hmm. uh lyrics and meaning aren't really looked at too seriously you know in music yeah i mean the amount of conservatives that listen to rage against the machine and like hey you know, mm-hmm. why are these guys getting into politics? It's like, well, that's like the entire band is that. You yeah, know? that's. <laughs> when weren't they? That's kind of Zach's whole thing. You know, last week we did System of a Down, and there's mm-hmm. plenty of conservatives that would listen to them and, and were very <laughs> angry at them, you know, talking about their political beliefs. Mm-hmm. When I found out, I didn't realize well, this, I'm that just... album cover that mm-hmm. we did last week. Yeah is taken directly from like a socialist party oh. political poster mm-hmm. from like Germany in the 1930s about fight take using all five fingers to fight the enemy. Oh, okay. and, and of course that enemy was fascism. Mm-hmm. I, so I, they chose that as their album yeah, cover. I laugh when you said that, but I also found out in my research last week that John, Walmart, John, no, John Dolmayan, the drummer from system is a conservative. So. Oh yes. Yes, he is. You know, I, I, I don't know if it's that necessarily that much of a, twist anyway back to um barrel black bonnet track four incident at six sixty six point six fm this is another quote-unquote instrumental um <laughs> and it, it's a skit basically a radio host and their listeners talking about how the group upsets white people and it's just like you know a couple a minute and change of that um and there's it's this nice... not a real it's not a real host though is it I mean, no it's probably it just some, a friend they brought in to do this radio voice uh, he sounded pretty convincing to yeah, me. <laughs> he did a good radio voice. maybe it's I, I almost... an actual radio dj who you know professional dj who they had you know do this scripted thing um but there's a nice uh, cameo from terminator x who they have you know they have a bunch of people calling in and one just says i'm terminator x yeah oh it, like like the predator or something you know yeah terminator x right I just got a kick out of that. Um, I've always loved that. Track five, Welcome to the Terror Dome. Nice Mad Max nod there. I think I'm picking this one for my strongest, honestly. I've always fucking loved this one. (laughs) Great sudden change from the opening. It starts with this kind of fanfare and then just just on a dime changes to this really chaotic groove um, that kind of plays against itself. Right. Love the syncopation in this one. Um, and this is where I have the note about, you know, they were the hip hop band that, you know, it was okay for the rock and metal and punk kids to like, because this is just as aggressive as any punk or metal. It's so aggressive. And yet there's like this little like soulful, like background voices going at the mm-hmm. same time. Yeah, yeah. It's just, uh, it just, it has so much yeah. that, yeah, that's why it gets so thick. There's this great call and response between Flav and the samples. I love how they, they kind of line the samples up with the rapping occasionally. Um, and then Flav has this great rant right bef- before <laughs> verse two. And then like right at the end, he has another little rant. He like quotes, I'm not sure where have a good treat comes from. But of course, the who put this together is, of course, Scarface. Okay, okay. I'm not sure where have a good treat comes from, though. <laughs> But it's fucking hilarious. And, then and to the, have in the middle of this, yeah, it's really fucking hilarious. The third chorus, there's this nice little um, kind of what the fuck where it just 
it just goes quiet for a second. Like you think it's going to be just another chorus and they change the track. So it just like quiets down for a second. Yeah. It's just such a nice little like. Hmm? <laughs> track six, meet the G that killed me. This is a 40 second long track, 45 second long track. Um, great bell and tr- bells in the intro, great insistent kick. And there's just this great back and forth with Chuck and Flav just rapping just uh, at a mile a minute. For 45 seconds. You know, I've listened to this album, I don't know how many times, but I never really paid attention to the the track listing until this week Mm -hmm. and had no idea that there were this many tracks on. I just assumed a lot of shit just flowed together in one track. Right. (laughs) I think this was 90. So this was like right on the edge of things going digital. Yeah. Well, this is a CD album because... It's 60 minutes. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. True, true. I mean, um, it's not like the absurd, like, early 90s where things started getting into, like, the 70-something right, minute right. thing. We're just like, mm-hmm. okay, no one needs to do this. Right, yeah. Because <laughs> I feel like it was kind of designed to not be, to be on, like, a more analog um, recording you know, medium where things did flow together more. Where you oh, couldn't yeah. necessarily pick out, pick out track by track. Um, track seven, Polywana Cracker. Nice laid back groove. Um, love the spoken vocal. I wish I knew who it was. Yeah, I wasn't a, much of a fan of this one. I really didn't remember it. It's probably because I skipped over it a lot. Mm-hmm. Back, it's just back this nice when. relaxed delivery, mostly spoken instead of rapped. Um, yeah. Um, about um, basically about um. People who have issues with interracial relationships. Yeah. Um, uh, there were these arguments between these couples um, after the choruses that were a really nice touch. One person in one ear, another person in the other ear. And they flip sides the second time they come back in. Um, has a nice sudden stop. Um, on to track eight, anti-N-word machine. <laughs> Let's roll that window up. Yeah, got to do it on this one. Um <laughs> Great chaotic opening. Um, I love how it kind of simulates scanning across a radio. Yeah. And then it just I settles. could have used more samples in the intro, honestly, yeah, which yeah. is surprising because there were a shit ton of samples yeah. in the intro. But that was that a lot of real estate to cover. Settles into this nice kind of frenetic groove. Um, it's instrumental for like almost two minutes. Yes. <laughs> There's no rapping for like two minutes. And then Flav interjects a little bit, and you think it's just one of his hey, hey kind of things. Right. And it's like, wait, no, there's a song here. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to actually rap. I mean, this is probably the proggiest of all the songs yeah. on the album because sense, yeah. it really just goes in like three directions. <laughs> it's it's Flav's little inter- interjection, <laughs> and then this like drum roll, and then they get into this other groove. It's kind of laid back, but then we're off with these intense sounds added to this laid back groove and just a ferocious rap from Chuck. And a sudden chaotic kind of lead into the next track, track nine, Burn Hollywood Burn. This one features Ice Cube and Big Daddy Kane. Great frenetic groove. Um, I always loved this one. Um, this is my favorite just because it was great to hear Big Daddy Kane again. Yeah. Uh, and Cube is brilliant, of course. This one gets going straight out of the gate. They don't fuck around at all. Right. With the, with the intro. Um, it's about how Hollywood has ruined the image of black people. Um, and it's pretty funny that the dude that went on, goes on to do the Are We There Yet movies is doing this. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, why not? He, he, he did his. I mean, he was NWA. I mean, he he, he worked for the. He, he <laughs> held the. He ran the banner for a long time. Yeah. He, Someone's got to get paid, you know. Yeah, exactly. Like, um, yeah, the but, concept of selling out is a quaint thing that, like the you know the kids these days don't even understand what that means. And honestly, in hip hop, it's not as nearly as much of a thing as it is like in rock. Yeah. Rock is where you know it's about the ideals and all that. You know, I guess though for NWA and Public Enemy though, you do hold them to that kind of standard yeah, because of what they did. But in the end, 
you, you got to eat, you know? But we can't I, deny that. I remember back in the day when you know, Run DMC did My Adidas. And people <laughs> were criticizing the movie because it was basically an ad. And oh, yeah. they explained, like, yeah, that's not really... A, that The whole selling out thing, not really a thing in hip-hop. We want to get paid. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, love the aggression on this one, and and you know, Cube, Cube and and Kane going you know with Chuck was great, and I love how it stops down for the quote unquote feature presentation, <laughs> which they don't even get into like why that is like a shitty shitty movie. <laughs> they just spent an entire song talking about it, right. But, you know, they're talking, they're putting it in terms of like um, steel magnolias in terms of endearment. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which, you know, putting you have down, to know I guess, those the, movies to get the, guy, get the joke, yeah. The, the chick flick kind of thing. Uh-huh. But it, but driving Miss Daisy, holy shit. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's a <laughs> So you have to understand a bit about the movie to get the joke, yeah. Track 10 Power to the People. Love the electric piano in the beginning and the kind of head fake that that turns into because then we get to some screechy horn samples and a very danceable track. Um, it's, it's really just an excuse for a great groove because the lyrics don't really mean very much. It's a close cover of James Brown's Get It Up and Turn It Loose. It's kind of that James Brown thing where it's the lyrics are just, you know, get up, dance, you know, get on the thing. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. The lyric it is almost the lyrics of "Get It Up" and "Turn It Loose." It's probably more so than "Brothers Got to Work It Out." Uh-huh. It is like Marvin Gaye's "Let's Get It On." Uh-huh. Well, no, Marvin Gaye's "Get Let's Get It On" was very definitely about a very specific thing. James Brown had that, you know, get on the scene, you know, just get up and dance kind of lyric that was very repetitive. Oh, right, get it up and turn it loose. The, yeah. the, the, those are practically the lyrics that he's using here. Yeah. And that's and, yeah, that's that's all this is is that excuse for that kind of that great groove. And then yeah. at two forty four, it completely changes into this kind of stuttering groove for the last minute. Um, that which was a great. Was. Left, I wish I'd looked that up. <laughs> great left turn. Um, track eleven. Who stole the soul? I swear, I heard Tom Sawyer at the beginning of this one. There's this low bass synth, um, but it's got it this. It wouldn't be that crazy because I mean, the the Beatles are on here. You mm-hmm. know, there's, uh, you know, I was thinking the last track. I always feel smart when I recognize the source of a sample, like when you that whole crazy extra from that song with the right about nows and the yeah. theme from Shaft mm-hmm. <laughs> in there. But we get that little little thing at the beginning, and and it, speaking of Tom Sawyer, this was a couple of years before YBT. So, oh yeah, you know if you've heard us talk about that. Think story. of how many samples that uh, were used on this album that were used on the um, Tribe Called Quest album that we did. True, true, yeah. Because they did um, they did Musical Youth. Uh, they did um, oh, what was the other one we even talked about earlier? With the the oh the Vincent Price. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, this is like, this is a seminal album. Yes. Fear of a Black Planet is like one of the most classic hip hop albums and one of the greatest hip hop albums of all time. Spoilers. Um, so, you know, <laughs> it's it's no surprise that someone's going to take from it, you know, decades later, even you know, Elder Respect the Tribe. They're, you know, they're great classic. They're, they're, they were, you know, one of the originals. But, you know, this is this is a blue. This album is a blueprint. <laughs> in many ways as the bloodhound gang said thou shalt add a book of flavor flav to the bible exactly um but yeah that that beginning with the low bass synth settles into this nice frenetic groove um nice har- sampled harmonies in the chorus this is one of those songs that is just a, ve- a vehicle for the lyric like there's nothing particularly interesting about the track it's just a bed for chuck to preach over yeah um his delivery on this one reminds me of his little rap in Funny Vibe by Living Color. Huh. If you remember Funny Vibe from the first Living Color album. No, I don't think I do. Um, it was that one. No, I don't want to rape you. No, I don't want to rob you. So I want to oh. give you that Funny Vibe. <laughs> yeah. In the middle of it, Chuck does a rap. And his his vibe on this one reminds me a lot of that. 
I mean, it's all just Chuck, you know, being angry. <laughs> He's kind of got one speed. <laughs> <laughs> but there's just something about the two that, that remind me of each other on to track 12 fear of a black planet i love the beginning of this one you have a radio voice that announces the track of the t- title <laughs> the name of the song title i've um, thought about this one a lot over the last five years and mm-hmm. it's like it, especially when they do the the demonstration of you know genetics yeah and what creates a black baby and what creates a white baby. And yeah, that's not th- exactly there, accurate. there is no, well, uh, in it's the eyes of, of racists, <laughs> it's like a, the, that drop of, of blood from some other place yeah. uh-huh. creates, right, in, right. in their eyes, it creates yeah. that race. Well, the whole, if the point of the song is, is it's about people who, you know, have this this belief that like you said any drop of black blood is going to create a black person and have just have right. a problem with interracial people um with with mixing um which is a very relevant thing these days because there are some very exactly. scary people who have a big issue with this who you know are are you know causing some issues um exactly the formula the demonstration he's talking about they're the people that are concerned with racial purity mm mm-hmm. You know, which yes. is, I mean, an absurd thing to be obsessed about because what is it? You know, what's it even mean? And, and <laughs> I, I've been, I've thought about a lot of this, of this a lot recently because of those scary people. If the purely accidental, if your purely accidental ethnicity, where your ancestors came from, and thus the color of your skin, is the thing you use to identify who you are, I pity you. <laughs> it's kind of crazy if there if there is nothing more interesting about you to hang your identity on that's sad it's uh it's living vicariously through people who are no longer here you know yeah, because Past a couple people. of hundred years ago some white guy in europe was a conqueror and you think you have some connection to that white guy because <laughs> you you may share a little bit of genes with him Although I'm a descendant of Genghis Khan, and I really like wearing fuzzy furry hats. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I mean, I am mostly British. <laughs> like I think that shows in my sense of guys. humor. But, <laughs> but um, it's just sad that there are people who who think that that particular that incredibly random aspect of who they are is that vital that it, it, that it's it's important. <laughs> <laughs> It's a fucking or dice roll. Or where it's going to be years from now, you know? Yeah. Uh, I just, it, who cares? Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, that's the whole point of the song. Um, love the deviations from the verse that aren't in the chorus. There's these other little sections that they cut to. Um, there's a great sampled organ sound. I love that. And there's just a metallic effect on Chuck's voice now and then. Yes. This kind of like it almost sounds like um, not a harmonizer. What am I talking? The thing that um, makes it sound like you're singing. Um, auto tune sounds like a little bit of auto tune. Um, I I don't know if it's just that or just a vocal effect that they're hmm. they're throwing on it and and feedbacking yeah. through kind of. I don't know, they get some kind of metallic effect on Chuck's voice now and then. It sounds really yeah. cool. On to track thirteen, Revolutionary Generation another great change where there's this opening fanfare and then it goes to the groove which is vastly different um you know a lot of play got a lot of stick because he wasn't really the front guy and you know he was just the hype man and just kind of there yeah but their voices work perfectly together oh yes totally the the lightness of flavor Flav's voice and the heaviness of chuck d's voice it's just you can't it's perfection yeah yeah um, love how all how the sample sort of joins the ramp the rap at the top of verse three like you know um, oh, well, I forget the line but like the first few words of the line that both Chuck and Flavor saying are the same as the sample <laughs> at the top <laughs> yeah. of the third verse loved that little kind of shock where you hear like what you think is just some random sample matching that the two rappers. Um, well, of all the extra percussion that comes in in the third chorus, um, 
this one maybe goes on a bit too long. It's like five and change. Yeah. At Soul Sister, that was a great hook. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, love how it kind of, the groove kind of changes for verse four, ends with a nice long sample of a speech. On two track 14, can't do nothing for you, man. Groove is very not early 90s. Yeah. This is the other flavor lead. Lyrics, I think, are a bit repetitive, and then there's this break that, again, is just more early 90s commercial white hip-hop. It, this is my pick for weakest. It's funny, but it really just doesn't fit with the rest of the album thematically, you know? Mm-hmm. You have this album that, you know, it, it's pretty much a concept album about the yeah. black experience. Yeah. Oh, that was and, a lot of their uh, stuff, though. That was pretty much most of all Gunway. I, I mean... And not just, you know, the everyday experience, which is, mm-hmm. this kind of reduces it down to, but just right. the overall experience, you know? Yeah. And this just was a little weird <laughs> about, mm-hmm. you know, and I got a friend that's like, oh, he, that, that, you know, he's asking for shit. Yeah. It's just kind of a throwaway. Um, yeah. It feels like, and I know this was a thing with analog recording, not when they did this, but, you know, they needed like one extra track for the master. <laughs> um, I have probably told this story, but New World Man by Rush was originally titled Project 3 something, the title, the length of the song, because yeah. they needed one more song that was a specific length long, or else mastering the album was going to be difficult. So they wrote New World <laughs> Man as literal filler to make the album easier to master. That, um, that is what they called them. They called them filler songs. Mm-hmm. Um this is what it cut you know, can't do nothing for you man kind of makes kind of feels like a filler song in that sense on to track 15 reggie jacks i was sure this was going to be about reggie jackson it could have been an honor i don't know who knows you know, just from the title but you know it's just, yeah it's um, like just over a minute and a half nice kind of reggae-ish groove chuck almost goes kind of dub on this one huh you know, reggae rap, that, you know, that style of rapping in reggae. He kind of leans into that a little bit. Um, but I, I really enjoyed that kind of just change of pace. You don't expect reggae on a, on a um, uh, public enemy album. You there? Yeah. You know, you don't expect reggae on a public enemy album. So that was just a nice little stop down, nice change of pace. Um, I realized it's last week I, I get it's a it's a good interlude, yeah, you know. Yeah. I um I realized I, mean, I teased this last time. Um, but my my story of when I first heard this album because I knew the two singles, nine one one is a joke and fight the power. But back in November of twenty nineteen, last time I set foot in a tattoo shop before the apocalypse, <laughs> hmm. they were short staffed. <laughs> um, so I had to wait like an hour for an artist. And they like to play albums there. So I'm in there waiting and I hear a little public enemy and I don't recognize the first two tracks. I just, I, I, of course, I recognize PE. And then it gets yeah. to 911 as a joke. I'm like, oh, cool. Fear of a Black Planet. And then they just played the whole album <laughs> <laughs> while I was waiting. And I'm sitting there looking through the books, you know, listening to Public Enemy. It was a great time to kill, a great way to kill an hour waiting to get a tattoo. I get finally get to the artist because they're short, short staffed, I it was a walk in. I end up with one of like their main artists who I would have had to schedule with. Wow. Um, as he's firing up the tattoo pen, opera singer by Cake kicks in. Uh, he so mentions, they play all of uh, Comfort well, Eagle. I don't know. He mentions it started Comfort Eagle. He mentions he's a big Cake fan. They're the artist. He's a you know he loves Cake. He's a, they're his favorite band. Um, Joe Numbers, that trade wins tattoo. If anybody in you know the Tom River area hears this, I highly recommend him. <laughs> um, but he fires up the gun at the start. It's a little tattoo. It's a very small piece, but he fires up the gun at the start of Opera Singer. By the time it got the shadow stabbing, I was at the desk paying for it. It was which that means, fast. <laughs> which means they played the whole uh, album. I and I was at the door before the end of shadow stabbing in an Uber, so. I'm assuming they played the whole album, <laughs> especially since Joe is a big cake fan. But that's the story I alluded to last time. Um, 
you know, after Reggie Jacks, it just kind of seemed like, you know, that was a good place to fill. put that on two track 16. Leave this off your fucking charts. This is an instrumental, <laughs> essentially a Terminator X solo. It's weird because it's like they just had an interlude with Reggie Jacks, mm -hmm. and now here's another one. <laughs> and it's, I, I love this sort of odd laugh that it starts with. And it's just this groove getting randomly interrupted by these sound, you know, X is just laying down this groove and then randomly interrupting it with these other sounds. And I love how he stacks sounds. Oh, you know, just the... one sample after another. Yeah. Um, well, he got a kick out of that one. On to track 17. Wow, there are a lot of tracks on this one. I know. I think this is the, not the longest album we've done by a long shot, but the most number of tracks we've done. It could be. Um, 17, B-side wins again. Great metal guitar riff at the start of this one. I totally don't remember this one either. <laughs> but but sonically, it's really interesting. So oh, yeah. I'm start, I was starting to wonder at this point, like, were there not, you know, was it not the full track listing on the CD I had? <laughs> I know I've heard it because they played the whole thing when I was sitting in the shop, but I I remember liking it. I Coming into this, I was pretty sure I was going to recommend it. I didn't remember specific tracks aside from those two singles. Um, great kind of, again, metal riff at the beginning. And then the track is really interesting because it's kind of acoustic. It's like an acoustic guitar and a bass and a bit it's of percussion. It's the closest thing you'll get as a, as a ballad. Yeah, basically. <laughs> um, although Chuck sounds like he's rapping over a phone. Yeah. There's a, there's Can't like, really get what he's saying under the effect. There's that effect on him. Um, there are some parts of this really nice delay on his voice, um, and then it just gets chaotic at the end. Track 18, War at 33 and a third. Love these high horns that just pan across during the verse. It's <laughs> irritating, but it makes you listen. I love his use of Edwin Starr's war in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the complete chaos that it turns into in the middle. Oh, yeah. Um, again, this is another one that it's all just about the lyrics. you got to pay attention to the lyrics. Um, track 19, final count of the collision between us and the damned. I fucking love that title. <laughs> I, I probably just assume this is part of Fight the Power. Uh, it might I, be, yeah. I totally really didn't remember this one either it's like wait what is wrong with me i mean it, I, I probably listened to it like yeah. 15 16 years ago less right. but it, it's like 49 seconds long of just this nice laid back groove and a few little subtle samples but just has this incredible title and finally track 20 fight the power great message to end the album on it's a great bookend to Brothers Gotta Work It Out. Mm -hmm. And a very close sibling musically to 911. Yeah, yeah. Um, great opening sample of the speech. I want to say it was, oh, I looked it up beforehand. Thomas, I can't remember his last name. Thomas Todd, I think it is, a civil rights attorney. Um, he's talking about how, you know, our, our soldiers don't want to fight anymore. They just want to switch. Yeah. Um, and then there's this great funk groove. Um, and more playing with the groove from Chuck. I just love how he syncopates his raps, is his flow. Um, how, there's this break in the middle where they, they know they've got a good thing. It's just this great funk groove. They just ride it for a, like a 10 count yeah. with no rapping over it. There's no Terminator X doesn't even throw any samples in. They just ride the groove for like 10 seconds and just let us enjoy it. Now, I think Spotify sampled this one or censored this one. I oh, yeah. Say. I think they censored yeah. it. They did. It's like an edit of it for some reason. I'm not sure why. Because I post on our social media, I posted the video, the Vivo video. So it's not the one, the censored version we all saw on MTV back in the day. But it's, you know, Elvis was a hero to somebody, never meant shit to me. Shit yeah. was sam was shit is censored from the Spotify version. And fuck was bleeped. I didn't catch that. Yeah. And they don't sample any other language. This is the first time I've heard I've heard Spotify sample or censor a language. I keep flipping that. Yeah. But right, I yeah, the rest of the album isn't censored at all. Mm. 
just that many, one one song. Plenty of other things we've reviewed. I mean, I'm a big Bad Religion fan. They sure as fuck don't censor Bad Religion. All well, right. <laughs> um, so it's weird that they sampled this. Like they, it's it was it, it's almost like they bought the Walmart Walmart copy and then like you know uploaded it to Spotify. You know, because yeah, Walmart so had that thing confusing. where they sold samples. Go ahead. It was very confusing, though. Yeah. So like, what? Why would this be sampled? I had the version. The, yeah, I don't remember being censored the version I had. Yeah. And I went and watched the video and just jumped to that line. And yeah, you clearly hear him say shit. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that was weird. Um. Spotify, get your shit together. Um. Love the ending where you have Chuck talking about the future. He's saying, you know, the future of PE is, and it just cuts off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, incidentally, Flav was kicked out years later. I thought that was recent. Well, it's on years later, so it is fairly recent. Like, Flav was kicked out, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's just kind of interesting. The past, like, five years or you know, so. Griff was kicked out. Was it just before or after this? Oh, I don't know. For being for some anti Semitic comments, yeah, Griff was kicked out shortly after this. I think it was shortly after. Um, Flav was kicked out recently, so it's just really prophetic that he says the future of PE, and then it just cuts off. (laughs) So, obvious question again, do you recommend it? Oh, of course. I loved this album uh, long ago, and listened to it many times, and it was good to take a trip back and listen to it again. Uh, I guess under these circumstances, though, it is, like I said, a concept album. I think if they had cut it a bit because this is a bit on the lengthy side mm-hmm. if this were like 45 minutes like all of the you know classic great albums i think it would be it would be pretty much legendary it would be <laughs> like this album they'd be like oh my god uh, but instead there's like a lot of connective tissue some of it works some of it's uh <laughs> and then you got like the additional flavor flav song that really doesn't well that's the only part that doesn't part. really work for me but beyond that i strenuously recommend it this album is seminal it is yeah. an absolute masterpiece a side possible exception of that one song um i have like i guess i strenuously recommend it so yes um and that's it for a favorite black planet until three weeks from now uh we're recording the we're recording the tv show next week so we're not doing the hearing uh following week we're off for my birthday keep an eye on our socials i will mention this on zombie takeout next week i forgot um i'm gonna be posting in the next couple of weeks my birthday recommendation list um oh thing i do around my birthday it's a bunch of media movies tv music um you know new media etc that i recommend checking out and i basically ask people to take a look at for my birthday, you know, if you don't know me and obviously aren't going to buy me anything, but you maybe could do something a little for me, check out some of these recommendations. I just really love curating media and like turning people on to, you know, media I'm into. So, but yeah. so that's something I do around my birthday. It'll be on our socials probably, you know, um, my birthday is the 25th, so pro- well, probably like a week before then. Anyway, uh, until the next time, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life. Until next time, we'll be reviewing The Firm by The Firm. I don't know if I said that. Until uh, then, all right. Of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are. There you are.